You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again. For Options Bootcamp, the program for you, the active retail stock trader. Maybe you're thinking about dipping those toes into the options waters. Maybe you're one of the legion, the millions who have done so en masse this year. Slinging your one lots hither and yon on platforms like your Robin Hoods and your Weebles and all your major brokers as well as newcomers on your TDs and your Fidelities and Schwabs and everything else out there these days as well. No matter how you're slinging those options or maybe considering how to do so. We welcome you here. This is the program for you folks. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as of course on the ever exciting, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network. Reminding you if you like what you hear, this program, all the other stuff coming at you, there's not just this program, it's Education Wednesday here in the network. As soon as you get an OPR hitting you later today, that's already in the can. Brian already recorded that one. Then, of course, we've got uh, interviews on the Tuesdays, Thursday. Got the second episode of the Option Block. You got TWIFO this week in Futures Options. Big things happening out there on the crypto side on Crypto Rundown. And indeed, TWIFO, CME just announcing ETH Futures this morning. Bitcoin blowing through 20,000. So a lot of stuff to unpack there as well as all your traditional commodity options, your metals, everything else going on out there, your ags, your energy. A lot of good stuff. Friday, volatility views. You have questions about vol. We know you do. It's a crazy time out there from a vol perspective. Got you covered on Friday, Monday, of course, the Option Block Episode 1, as well as well as the Advisors Option and a bunch of other fun stuff all scattered in there throughout the week. So if you like what you hear for all that stuff, make sure you keep those reviews coming on your platform of choice. More important than ever in these troubled times to let people know exactly what's available for them out there. Also, keep those questions coming. We do love to hear from you guys. Let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. I'm pleased to say I'm joined once again by the black-hatted one himself. Mr. Dan Passarelli, founder of Market Taker Mentoring and the author of one or two options-oriented tomes. Mr. P, welcome back to the Options Bootcamp Drill Instructor Proving Ground, sir. Hey, buongiorno, uh, Mark and everyone else out there. Uh, great to be here, and I hope you're excited as well. I am super excited, so let's get down to business. It is time for a little bit of the old basic training. All right, Boot, it's time to get live. What you're going to do is learn. You're going to learn how options work. Do you hear me? You're going to learn options trading inside and out, basic to complex. There will be no failures. Do you hear me? Pull in. Prepare to learn. Ah, 
so festive. No matter what time of year it is, could be our real first snowfall here in Chicago in December. It doesn't matter. Because it's always kind of a festive July season on the Options Bootcamp Show when we hear music like that. Yes, welcome to the basic training, the portion of the show. We break down some basic, sometimes a little bit more advanced, like we're going to touch on today, concepts here. And explain how you can incorporate them in your own options trading. And as we were mulling over topics that are kind of interesting and very timely for what's going on out there right now, we were inspired by this question from the listener, Bill Q. Bill Q wanted to know. Do the hordes, <laughs> like how he puts it, do the hordes of noob one lots pouring into the markets from places like Robinhood open up opportunities for the rest of us? And I wouldn't put them all in the noob category there, Mr. Bill Q. <laughs> they're just, they're starters. Everyone has to start somewhere, right? And it just turns out a lot of people are starting in options this year. It's okay. It's what the show like this is for to help guide you down that path. But in answer to that question, does this flood of new and, let's say, less experienced paper hitting the options market, does it open up some opportunities? And the answer is yes. We're going to get into some of those today. Mr. P, are you ready? And do you, before we even get started, do you have any off the top of your head responses here from Mr. Bill Q's question? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, yes and yes and no. Um I how how deep you want to get into this right now? Are we going to have a follow up conversation about it, or because because I do have some things to say? We'll get into it right now. Then how about let's let's just kick the ball off right now. I'll kick the ball off, and you could you could add in your two cents, peppered liberally as seasoning throughout. How does that sound? Sounds tasty. I like, I like a little bit of flavor to my meals here, just not too much. You know, it's a little <laughs> bit of seasoning. That's a good good measure for Dan. A little bit. Not too much. <laughs> I'm sure your wife says the same thing all the time. All right, let's keep rolling here. All right, let's get into some of these things, some of these impacts that we're seeing. And they are, quite simply, uh, titanic. You know, people often say, you know, it's institutions that move the markets and the retails are kind of not doing much out there. But a year like this, we've had some of our other shows, we've kind of referred to them jokingly as like the one-lot whale, the retail whale. Either way. However you want to break it down, the one lots out there, the small trades, and again, not all one lots are retail. We put that out there. There's a lot of algos and breaking up of larger orders, I should say, to fill certain order types and certain routing type procedures that make them into smaller chunks. One lots are pretty small. You don't see them too often, but there are not all one lots are these small retail trades you may think they are. But still, there are a lot of smaller trades hitting the market, much more than there have been in the past. Of course, there's much more options paper hitting the market than there ever has been. Just about every month this year has been, if not the busiest month ever, then somewhere in the top three. <laughs> They're just blowing the doors off pretty much every month. And a lot of that is coming in, a lot of these newer brokers and newer traders coming in and, and doing the one lots. If you listen to our election night special, for example, we had Henry Schwartz from Trade Alert, which is a great platform. I'm going to use it a lot today. So I encourage you, if you want to check it out, Trade Alert is the place to go. He talked about how just this year alone, there's a million one lots hitting the tape every day that pretty much didn't exist a year ago. Now, some of that could be the aforementioned, you know, algos and big orders getting broken up. But a majority of that is pretty much new retail flow hitting the marketplace. And what is it doing? Well, it's pretty much aggregating in a handful of names. Like, for example, Tesla. <laughs> you guys love yourselves a little bit of Tesla. Our buddy, the same guy, Mr. Flowmaster, a.k.a. Henry. He just tweeted out. I do believe it was yesterday, the day before we recorded this. <laughs> he likes to parse the numbers. He said, open interest in Tesla right now. And he put out an alarming graph. I encourage you, if you don't follow him, at Option Alert, check it out for yourselves. I think we retweeted it and shared it as well. Tesla makes up 17% of the open interest of the entire U.S. options market right now. So that's up there. That's not that far away from huge products like the SPX out there. I was, I was closing in on $100 billion worth of, uh, now this is kind of value, so take that with a bit of a grain of salt, but still, how much interest out there is in Tesla? It dwarfs SPY. I mean, SPY, everybody loves SPY, right? Nope, Tesla. It dwarfs Apple. It dwarfs Amazon. It dwarfs the Qs. You can pretty much take SPY, Amazon, Apple, the Qs, and VIX and add them all up together from an options perspective, and they're not coming close to Tesla right now. So that just shows you how much interest is in this this one one crazy name <laughs> out there. And what are people doing in these names? Well, it seems like a lot of the paper is unidirectional, shall we say. A lot of people coming in and they're buying calls on these hot names. Not just Tesla, but your Neos and your Apples 
and everything else. We'll start off looking at Tesla because it's a bit of a, shall we say, controversial one out there right now. So the first nugget I'm going to remind you of, if everyone's out there and their mother and their grandmother in this case, gobbling up calls, what's the one thing you probably don't want to do in that name? You don't want to be the lemming who follows in right behind him. Say, hey, there's 80 million people buying calls in this name. I want to be the 80 million in first contract that goes up out there. Probably not a road to long-term profitability for a lot of reasons. All these people buying up these calls are going to make these things more expensive from an applied volatility perspective. It makes it harder for you to break even on that trade at the end of the day. So obviously, the inverse of that is going to be attractive. So things like covered calls in a name like Tesla right now are going to be very attractive because the calls are very expensive. Vol is expensive as a whole. So covered calls, if you can afford the underlying, which a lot of people can't, a uh, covered call is certainly naked call selling. No, no, no. We don't want you to go out there and do that. That's, that's a dangerous road to go down there. So you definitely don't want to consider that. And if you're even going to sell call verticals out there in Tesla, they're going to tie up some margin for that. So maybe that's a little bit, a little bit too much for beginners out there. But there are some ways you can take advantage of this that are kind of interesting. Now, what does this flow do? What does this kind of unidirectional flow in names like Tesla and others do? Well, it tends to bid up things that are called the wings. And if you don't know what we're talking about with wings when it comes to skew, I encourage you to check out some of our earlier episodes where we talk about volatility skew in a lot more detail. Also, check out Options Playbook Radio with Brian. He gets into it in detail there as well. But effectively, your volatility skew comes in two flavors, two portions. Consider the the at-the-money strike to be the pivot, the fulcrum there. And then above that, all the strikes above that are lumped in together in what's called the call wing. They're measuring the implied volatility on those strikes above the the at-the-money and below the the at-the-money is what's called the put wing for obvious reasons. Now, in a name like Tesla, where a lot of people are flocking in to the calls, let's see how that skew rates right now. I actually broke it down again using the aforementioned trade alert platform. There's a lot of different tools you can use to do this. We'll get into that in a little bit as well. But right now, coming into today's show, the 30-day skew. So that's straight up 30-day implied volatility skew, your traditional 25 delta put and your 25 delta call in Tesla is in the 73rd percentile out there. So 100 is obviously at the apex out there, but it's at 73% right now. So it's that's actually going back the year. It's actually not the highest it's been. It's actually been higher throughout the course of this year, but it's still extremely high. And call open interest just by itself is pretty much in the 94%. So it's pretty much almost at the highest level it's been all year. So call OI is kind of on the rampage out there, which is understandable given what we just talked about with Tesla OI making up 17% of the entire U.S. options market. Now let's, let's work out a quick example of some of the impacts you might see in this. Let's use everyone's favorite name, XYZ. Uh, you know, you might go out there and say, hey, you know, I want to buy an at-the-money call. Cost a buck fifty. That's in XYZ in our example. That's expensive. What if I sell, let's say, a 20% out of the money call against it? I do a vertical instead to make that cheaper. In our example, that call is going to be, let's say, 25 cents. So now instead of paying a buck fifty for that vertical, you're getting that vertical for a buck twenty-five. Not bad, not great, but not bad. Now, what happens in our example? Let's say it follows a Tesla trajectory. These folks start flooding in, bidding up that call wing to astronomical levels. Now, it's going to bid up vol overall, so your at the money call is going to go up a little bit as well. It's going to go up, in our example, went up from a buck fifty to a buck sixty, went up a dime. But the 20% out of the money calls, those farther out of the money calls where there's a lot of juice going flooding into these names, they're going to go up quite a bit. In our example, they went up a lot. They went up 50 cents. <laughs> they went up some 25 cents to 75 cents. So what happens to that vertical now? Uh, and that could be a little bit extreme. You're probably going to see smaller swings in the real world. We want to kind of make this trend emblematic for you and easy to understand. Now, that vertical you were just buying for a buck twenty-five, And now in our example, it's gone down about 30%. It's down to about $0.85 cents out there. So that's a huge reduction. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about here when we're looking at opportunities that are being created by this flood of unidirectional paper in these names. Before I keep going, it's time for the seasoning, the sprinkling of passerelli flavor on this. Dan, what are your thoughts in general on the mass of one lot call buyers that are flooding the market into names like Tesla and others? And what are some opportunities you think that generates? You know, there's a couple of things. And one, you mentioned something earlier about the election night special we had. And if you would please remind Uncle Mike that we had a wager that he said we would have a clear winner announced before midnight on election. 
would you mind telling me telling him that he still owes me a dollar and rubbing <laughs> it in as much as humanly possible? I will facilitate the PayPal slash Venmo arrangements behind the scenes forthwith, sir. <clears throat> yes, I would very much appreciate that. Very do, uh, you know, <laughs> thing. Um, so, you know, the other thing that I think a lot of people don't think about, and especially we're talking Tesla here, so a ton of the volume in Tesla is, you know, just for oversimplification, like you just said, supporting what you just said, you know, these Robin Hood one lot kids who are, who are you know, buying, buying calls because they can't afford the stock and they think it's going to go up because they like electric cars, you know, um, and, so, you know, like, what are their financials? Oh, you know, and so like, here's what it's important to realize happens that when someone buys a call, what market makers have to do is, well, market makers are the ones that sell calls. And when market makers sell calls, they get short deltas. And so they have to buy stock to hedge. And so like this, you know, the, these Robin Hood kids who are buying one lot calls uh, or two lots or whatever, it doesn't matter how many they are, you know, just buying them just because they're speculating. What that does is it, it creates all these short deltas for market makers that have to buy stock. And like that creates demand on the stock price. And what was there earlier this year? Elon Musk said, uh, I mean, I, I messed up the pair. So I'm going to like hit hard the point that I'm paraphrasing, but that that test was overvalued. Right. And this is probably one of those reasons why it's overvalued. Uh, there's just all this silly, silly demand being created. Like there's not a better word. Uh, you know, I don't think you find the word silly in a lot of economic textbooks, but it's kind of silly demand being created. A lot of silly things going on out here in these names. Now, again, it's going to vary depending on your broker and your platforms, how easy it is for you to evaluate things like the SKU in these names. Some brokers do better jobs of others. I like to use independent kind of standalone platforms, like I mentioned, Trade Alert, but that's an extra subscription. I know some of you, for the pro level, that gets pretty pricey. They also have kind of the the watch trading flavor of that as well. I encourage you to check that out if you're inclined, because that's a little bit more retail-friendly pricing. It's all part of the SIBO empire now, so I'm not sure how how they've changed the pricing, but it used to be the what's trading was the easier entry point for an audience like this program to start messing around with the SKU. I also like some of the live vol tools. That's also, again, part of the SIBO empire. SIBO has acquired just about everything from an options, analytics, and data perspective these days, but they do a great job of also mapping out and showing the SKU, usually better than a lot of your brokerage tools that are going to kind of throw it out there. So if you're looking at ways to evaluate SKU, keep that in mind. Also keep in mind there's a couple of moving parts to SKU. Sometimes they throw you just a number like, hey, the SKU is 82 in this name. And you're like, huh? It's kind of like the SKU index that SIBO puts out for the S&P. It's just one number. What does that mean? By itself, it means nothing. You know, does it mean the calls are bid? Does it mean the puts are offered? What's going on out there? You have to really look at the SKU as two independent moving parts, which is why I like, we talk about it every week on Twifo. It's a good starter for a lot of listeners of this show as well. Go on over to cmegroup.com slash Twifo or slash Twio, T-W-I-F-O or T-W-I-O. Those reports are all free and they'll give you some basic SKU analysis there as well. It's a lot of it is for everything trading on CME. So there's going to be ags and metals and energy, but it's also equity indices there as well. So you can see how the S&P SKU is shaping up and also, more importantly, how it compares to last week as well as how the SKU has shift and slid along the curve. So you can break that down in a lot of moving parts. And to my mind, it's the only, one of the few, I should say, really, tools out there that breaks down the skew in terms of independent call wing and put wing. So you can see exactly what's going on. That, to me, is the best way uh, to analyze skews. Otherwise, you just see one number or 1%. You're like, what does that mean? Are the puts bid? Are the calls bid? We broke it down a little bit more out here in some other names. Neo has also been a hot name a lot of you guys have been flocking into. In fact, there were a few days out there over the course of the past month. You know, if you listen to any of our other shows, you know, we break down some of the hot options that are trading out there. Neo has trumped them all. Some days it trumped Apple and it trumped Tesla, which is no mean feat out there. These days it's doing a little bit less paper. There's been some issues, shall we say, going on with Neo. So the skew has actually uh, come in quite a bit. The skew was super call heavy, like all these other names were. Coming into today's show, we just ran the numbers. Neo is actually only in the uh, pretty much fifth percentile for the year. 
right now. So it is by no means super call heavy. And that's not to say the calls aren't rich. It's just kind of everything is rich out there right now. The puts are rich as well. I broke it down right now. You can look at the expirations in terms of skew here on trade. I'm looking, let's look, let's pick a month. Let's pick like the January expiration on the, uh, on the 22nd out there. The calls and puts, 25 Delta call, 25 Delta put, actually trading at about the same levels of implied volatility, both about 81%. That is very rare. If you know anything about equity options, you know, that's kind of a rare event. That shows people are expecting vol. They don't know which direction is coming, but they're expecting. You know, most equity options are put traded at a premium from a vol perspective. Calls trade at a discount, and we're not seeing that. So the calls are still bid in NEO. So it may be interesting and still viable to consider verticals out there, just perhaps not as attractive as it was, let's say, a month ago. Let's do the same analysis out there in Apple. Apple skew has also come in a bit, which is kind of interesting and maybe a little bit surprising. Call skew is only in about the ninth percentile right now for the year. So that means there's been points where it was much higher than it is right now. So maybe in some of these names, call verticals, not as attractive as perhaps they were a month or two ago. But the same, same notice doesn't mean calls are cheap out there in Apple. I'm looking at the numbers here now. Let's pick the same expiration, January 22nd in Apple as well. We're seeing the calls actually trading at a slight premium. To the puts, which again, if you know anything about equity options, is aberrant and weird. It's about a 35% for the calls, a 25 delta call, your very standard risk reversal, 34.5% for the puts. So the call is actually trading at a premium. So that still does open up opportunities for verticals and covered calls and everything else. Just remember, perhaps not as attractive as it was a couple of weeks ago. Dan, getting back to some of that seasoning out there. What are your thoughts on the evolution of some of the skew and some of these names, how they actually are trading at almost equidistant, uh, pretty much a smile out there in Neo and Apple and some of these other names and, and some opportunities that are afforded by that, sir? Yeah, I mean, throughout all the optionable names out there, um, it, it's a pretty rare scenario, but it's not a unique scenario. Um, uh, Apple options, like a decade ago, you saw this in Apple options too, you know, it's just, I mean, you, it's very, very common to see that in a name where there's a lot of retail demand. And, and, and I don't want to, um, I, I want to put into perspective my last statement about Tesla when I said silly demand, uh, that was not necessarily a statement that, or something that Tesla stock is overvalued because, I mean, hey, look at Apple, you know, um, a decade ago for a very long time, you saw that smile. In fact, there were times when the calls were bid higher than the puts. Uh, and, you know, that stock just continued to rise and rise and rise. So the stock may be overvalued as a result of that or, or it may not. But like that, it like this this whole conversation started out from that one question, like, our Robin Hood guys of, and, and and we're saying Robin Hood guys, like Mark pointed out earlier, is a generalization. Like it's retail in general. Do retail traders, uh, you know, af- create affect stock prices and create opportunities? And the answer definitely is to some degree yes. But make sure you take that in context in proportion. Um, saying with a grain of salt sort of like makes it sound less important than it is, but like, you know, don't think it's ultra important either, you know? Yeah, let's let's kind of summarize here what we're looking at. So a couple of things. First off, do all these flood of new traders create opportunities? Yes, but you have to do your diligence and your homework to figure out exactly what the opportunity is and how good it is in comparison to history. So you need some tools to do that trade alert live vol, both good ones. Your brokers, again, varies that maybe we should kind of come up with a list of some of the best analytical tools on the platforms out there. Toss has really good stuff. I mean, that's part of the big empire now, so we'll see how that evolves. But yeah, it's interesting to see kind of what's available out there on different platforms. Probably do a whole show on that. Maybe we will. But in general, you need to start breaking down these opportunities to see where they're emerging. Tesla is obviously a hot one right now. That's still in the 73rd percentile out there for the year in terms of how juicy those calls are. So probably more opportunities there than perhaps comparatively there are in a Neo or an Apple right now because they're still below 10% in terms of percentile for the year. It doesn't mean the calls are cheap. You have to go do your homework. Start analyzing, let's say, the opportunities. You don't want to be the lemming who goes out there and just loads up on calls like everybody else. That's a difficult 
path to profitability. Doesn't mean it can't happen. These stocks continue to explode up, so it can work out, but it's a more difficult path now than it pretty much ever has been. So you want to take steps to improve your chances of profitability. Verticals are the first and easiest way to do that. People are bidding up far out of the money calls to outrageous levels. Take advantage of that to get verticals at prices you probably couldn't do before, particularly in names like Tesla where the call skew is still high. And also look at the vols across the wings. Remember, skew is two components, the put wing and the call wing. So maybe in your particular name you're looking at, the puts are really big. In which case, and the puts are pretty juicy in names like Neo and Apple right now as well, trading pretty much equidistant uh, to the call. So that might open up opportunities for depending on how, what you want to do out there. So keep in mind, the SKU has two moving components to it. If you're confused by all this, you know what the hell SKU is, again, check out our earlier episodes, dig into some earlier options playbook radio as well, I should say, easy for me to say, where we break it all down in a lot more detail. We're kind of just looking at some timely uh, opportunities out here. And speaking of timeliness, let's get to it with a little bit of your mail call. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, welcome to the mail call. We like asking you guys questions sometimes on these two, like we're doing right now. We're just talking about Tesla. This episode, you guys all have Tesla on the brain these days, so we thought we'd put it to you. We're breaking down the OI right now, a lot of great tools to do that as well out there. We looked at it, and one thing... It's very clear. We talked about how excited people are for calls out there right now in terms of the one lots. Still net in the open interest, puts are dominating calls overall. So there still is large scale interest in puts a little bit longer term out there in Tesla, which allows us to ask the question and put it to you guys. No cheating. Don't pull it up in your platform of choice. Just use your gut. I'm going to ask the same question for you, Dan, let you play along as well. Quite simply, what is the largest open call position? In Tesla right now. I'll give you a hint. You got to go pretty much outside the top 10 to even find it. There's no calls in the top 10. It's all puts in the top 10 out there. And Dan, we gave them four choices. So you can play along as well. It's the June 500 calls, the D's of this year, 700 calls, the Jan 80 calls, 80, or the March 650 calls. Dan, which one do you think is your choice? A, and then B, more importantly, what do you think our audience is voting for? Oh, man. Well, <clears throat> I'm thinking maybe the Jan 800 calls. Uh, and I don't know. Like, it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out of limb and say. The, the Jan 80s, you mean? Oh, yeah, wait. Jan 80s, D 700s, June 500s, or March 650s. Oh, Jan, Jan, Jan 680s, you mean? No, Jan 80, just 80. Meaty call. Oh, that would be crazy, man. <laughs> the Jan, real, I, I mean, I would surely imagine that that is not uh, that that is not the one. Um, uh, I'm going to say, um, geez, this is a tough one, isn't it? How about I'm, I'm going to say the I'm going to say the D700 calls and I'm going to say that for for both myself and the audience. Right, that's actually a good a good guess. I can't reveal. What the answer is, I'm going to send it over here to the show chat, though, what the answer is. It's going to, it's going to surprise you, I think. Uh, June, let's see. We've got uh, June 500s, D700s, Jan 80s, and March 650s. And right now, leading the dance are the March 650s with about 42%, followed by number two, the D700s, 35%. Number three, the June 500s, 14%. And no love for your aforementioned Jan 80s there. <laughs> Very meaty. Dan, only about 9%. That's going to be live for a few days here. So listeners, you'll have a chance if you're listening live to get to it, and you'll have a chance after the fact uh, to get to it as well. But you have a lot more questions. Don't worry. If you're listening live, you get a special treat. You get to hear our next episode, our holiday mail call, Palooza, live right now after this program. Otherwise, you got to wait a week. Uh, sorry for all you podcast listeners out there. But before we go, Mr. P, if folks are intrigued, they want to learn a little bit more about what you have cooking over there in the land of MTM, where should they go? What should they do? Well, we would sure love you to come and visit us on our little piece of the World Wide Web, markettaker.com, two T's in a row. And, um, yeah, come join us. We, we've got a free membership that you can um, join, no cost, uh, but lots of value. And, um, you know, just, uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Love to help however we can. 
Check them out, MTM. Also, check out our friends over there at Demand Derivatives. You guys have been pretty enthusiastic about that campaign, so much so that they wanted to extend it for a bit to give some of our listeners. They only started talking about it on our network like a week or two ago. Give you more time. So I think they're actually extending it to sometime early next year, Q1. I'm not sure exactly when. So you get a little bit more time to kick the tires over there. Check them out, demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. To learn more, and on behalf of Mr. P and our friends over there at Demand Derivatives, and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live. If you're listening live, stay tuned. We'll be right back with another episode. Otherwise, we'll see you back here next week for another episode of Options Bootcamp. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.